Welcome, Sir Steve and Sir Dave, uh, to the 42 Courses podcast. It's such an honour to have you both on the show today. Um, and for, for those of you who don't know who Steve and Dave are, uh, Steve Harrison is, uh, I think, one of the most awarded uh, copywriters who's ever lived. Um, no. <laughs> incredible, uh, incredible chap. Uh, and Dave has uh, one of the most popular blogs on the internet. Um, if you haven't read uh, Stuff from the Loft, uh, get on there right away. And also um, an incredible, incredible gent. Um, and and, uh, and, and they... actually has won more awards than most people have. Um, true, yes, true, yes, true. He has, also... he has more pencils than the Crayola factory. <laughs> You can, as you can tell, if you're watching us on video, by all the books behind you as well, it's, it's, it's really impressive. What, what are they actually, Dave? Uh, all sorts of magazines and I'm trying to think. What, yeah, all sorts of uh, crucial magazines like Sunday Times from the seventies and God knows what. All the stuff my wife's been nagging me to get rid of. But, um, obviously, value more stuff. critical stuff. But we're we're here to chat about like um, you know getting good copies of things to when I do a blog, rather than those little pixelated things that you can't quite read. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, we're here to talk about um, another another uh, famous ad person who um, is uh, is almost as talented as you both, uh, uh, Howard Gossage. Um, and you've written this absolutely incredible book. Ta -da, if you're looking at the screen, it's uh, called Howard Gossage, The Howard Gossage Show, uh, and what it can teach you about advertising, fun, fame, and manipulating the media. Um, but uh, I thought I'd start off and just say, uh, how did this come about? I'll, I'll, I'll just kick off and say that I, I, just, I first chanced across Howard Gossage in 1988. So he's been a big part of my career. And I probably know more about the chap than is good for me or than anyone else in, in the industry, I, I would say. Um, and as a result, Dave asked me to do one of his hands up if you've heard from posts. You know, he, he, he rescues people from obscurity um, and makes them and brings puts the spotlight upon them. And he asked me to do the Gossage post. Uh, and then I did it um, over to you, Dave, and your reaction to it really was crucial. I, t I suppose the thing that, I, you know, I do uh, blogs and podcasts about different people. And the thing that I knew most about Gossage which is a, not anything compared to Steve. He's just, he had some very clever quotes that I always liked and often would use in meetings. Nobody reads an ad. They read what interests them. Sometimes that's an ad. Uh, it's a familiar one. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. But I was always sort of struck that there wasn't much of his work around. So other people who are uh, revered, like Gossage, there seems to be a bigger body of work. So through my time of do, putting out blog posts and things every time i would be looking for a piece of work on something to do with ddb or whatever it may be if i'd come across anything that was howard gossage i'd scan it very high res and put it in a file and leave it somewhere and then after a while i thought well, i should put them out because some of them are better quality than the things in the book of gossip um so i went straight to steve because he's like the expert on gossage i thought well, i don't know really what i'd write i've got all the pictures but i don't know what i'd write and asked steve i think Initially, there was an issue, wasn't there, Steve? And I can't remember whether you were busy on something or you weren't sure because you've been done such a lot of gossage. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't. I, I, I was. I think I'd got a personal problem at the time. With um, if you remember, there was my, there was an illness in the family, and I was a bit distracted by things. And I said, "Nah, you know, kind of." And I, um, I, I passed on it, didn't I? And you, you gave it to to another another gossip aficionado. Yeah, so I was kind of, I thought, oh, it's heartbreaking because Sting is the best person in the world mm -hmm. to write it. But, you know, he was busy and doing something, couldn't do it. So I spoke to somebody else who was going to do it. Then Steve got back maybe a week or two later and said, actually, no, I, I should do it. I want to do it. And I said, oh, it's really awkward because I've asked someone else now. Uh, I can't stand them down. They may be about to send over a few thousand words. You know. uh, anyway, I thought, well, let's tentatively ask this guy whether he's um, whether he's started, finished, where he's at. And his reply was, I'm really sorry. I just don't have time to 
get to it, which gave me a very elegant uh, opportunity to say, don't worry, let me take that off your hands. <laughs> and uh, I think we've got it sorted. So anyway, so then brilliantly, we had Steve, which initially was going to be a blog post with the, the stuff I've got. Me partly feeling guilty that, uh, you know, whenever people do guest posts, there's a slight guilt that you think, it's going out on my kind of platform. What am I doing? You know, I'm just press it publish i'm not really doing much so i thought i wonder if i can find some more of his work mm. i had about 30 or 40 pieces and i thought maybe i can contribute in that way so i started manically looking here there and everywhere for certain things i'd heard about but hadn't seen but at the end of that journey we had about 200 ads you know mm. and as i sort of went through trying to find things you know laboriously going through page by page New Yorkers and various magazines every now and again I'd find something think that feels a bit like his I wonder whether it is and we would save it with a question mark on the folder send it over to Steve and he'd say that is that isn't he definitely worked on old work he'd, I'm not aware of him working on that so we had then a mountain of stuff hmm. that you think well, it seems a kind of waste really to to put it out as a one-off post you know we've got all this stuff now Steve's written you know, what Steve was writing was growing as fast as the stuff that uh, I was finding. So we thought, well, maybe we do it as a book if people still, uh, if books still exist anymore. So we started looking looking at doing it as a, as a book. It was it was good for me because I'd, I'd written, a, I'd already written a biography of Howard Gossage, um, which tended to focus upon the, his, his uh, non-for-profit work. You know, yeah. kind of, uh, and the cause related non -prof non for profit work. Um, I, I, and, and, you know, kind of, we're at, at the expense of his commercial clients to, to a degree. And I'd spent several weeks in San Francisco working at Goodby Silverstein, going through Alice Lowe's archive. Um, uh, the mm -hmm. wonderful Alice Lowe, who'd left all of her box after box of Gossage memorabilia mm -hmm. artifacts to Jeff Goodby with the view that they must be put in the Bancroft Library for popular uh, consumption at, at Berkeley University. And I, at the penny had dropped with me that I don't think we'd shone the light on Gossage's brilliance as a copywriter. And I always intended to mm. redress that, that balance for his commercial clients. And then Dave is feeding this idea that I'd had that we haven't really focused upon his brilliance as a as, as a sales as a as a great soft, master of the soft mm. sell, you know, um, and it all started days feeding me another great ad which I'd never seen before, and um, you know, kind of, and and it all we we were feeding off each other to an extent, you know. So the book is whilst it covers the non for profit stuff. Dave made an observation when we were discussing this only recently. He said, did Gossage ever write a charity ad? And apart from the Grand Canyon cause-related stuff, we haven't found any evidence of any charity advertising, but we've got hundreds of ads for commercial clients that nobody, I mean, I, there were some that I didn't even know he had as clients, you know. Um, and, mm. and yeah, so it was... One hand washed the other as far as the gestation period of this of this book was concerned. I mean, obviously, Steve is, is I'm doing that purpose driven charity sort of stuff. So it was tough mm. dragging him on away from that into the uh, commercial stuff. He says I, jokingly, well, the, 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 the non the non profit stuff that he did. It was done by the agency, but it was done primarily by Jerry Mander, who was who who Howard hired to be the copywriter in the agency so that Howard didn't have to write any copy anymore. Uh, Howard was just knackered. After 10 years of churning out brilliant campaigns, one after another, you know, of long copy campaigns, as well as Dane said, hundreds of ads. By 1966, the guy, I think, was exhausted uh, and had burnt himself out on the copywriting front. Is that perhaps one of the reasons why he's not, so well known. So, I mean, it, in his in his time, everything I've read said that he, you know, he was he was super famous within his time. But as times move on, you know, most people will remember David Ogilvy and Bill Burnback and yeah. a few others. But you don't really often hear about Howard. But it does seem that he had this very productive, quite short 
period where he burnt yeah, his, yes. yeah, yeah. burnt his right and and then and then literally sort of killed. In, in one way it's a miracle we've heard of it i mean that it was such a tiny outfit Mm. Um, I mean, what was there? Twelve people. I mean, Ogilvy. How many people do, did Ogilvy in forty-five agencies we around done? the world? Yeah. So obviously they've got massive scale on their side, and they've got famous work. But he's almost right in all of their ads, yeah. you know. And it's amazing, you know. It would be a it's a sort of consultancy, really, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Uh, so the fact that they they became so famous <clears throat> is incredible, really. In, in the... And I think the volume is, you know, that if you sort of cross-reference the years, there would be some years that he's got three or four ads in a copy of the New Yorker, uh, Eagle shirts, Fina, Salada, all of you know, in one issue. You think, well, how is he even doing that? Because that was a weekly issue. Ads. That was one every week. Um, no, no wonder he, he yeah. decided. It. I mean, he said early doors that writing copy, doing an ad and writing copy, was like giving birth to a grand piano as far as he was concerned. It didn't come easy to him. Um, and he would, he, the, we've got letters in the book, I think maybe, uh, any anyway, reference in the book to him telling John Steinbeck, I want to get out, you know, kind of, I've had enough of this business and that was in 65. And he ended up asking people like John Steinbeck to write the ads for him, you know, which, which they attempted. It didn't become famous because I think that his, his style of advertising wasn't fashionable then and probably has never been fashionable in that he was more of a sales promotion man. You know, it was sales promotion ideas and uh, direct response, direct marketing formats, you know, kind of, which, which the advertising industry, which we would, you might refer to above the line advertising industry, has always looked down its nose at. The art direction looks like it's from another era. Yeah, and even in the fifties and sixties, it's not like it's from the twenties and thirties. Yeah. It's all this ornate, old-fashioned typefaces with lots of little ornate pieces all over the place. So I think at the time when Burnback came in, and it was all stripped back, and it was Swiss, and it was photographs, and you know, he his ads would have little subheads and little swirly bits, and they just felt like they're from another era. So I think, you know, wrongly. They were just the, the very style of them as well would go against them, uh, as well as them being very, um, you know, coupons weren't a very fashionable thing then. We don't see many coupons on Burnback ads, you know. Um, but I, I also think that they didn't bother reading them because when you start reading them, I mean, your first, your first view of them is, oh God, this looks like a hard sell, direct response, you know, kind of. It's going to be. But what Howard did was he took that formula and he said to the readers, I think, you know, this is a formula. I know it's a formula. You know how it works. I know how it works. Let's just send it up. And they were, and once you realize that it's a massively irreverent take on salesmanship, you know, kind of you read some of his call to actions, you know, which is a term direct response advert copywriters use when at the end of the ad you know so write please write in this would be why haven't you written in get a pen now you know what are you thinking of you know and he, he would hector them and he knew you know kind of like he, he knew he was he was parodying the hard sell you know kind of. out of the one where he said please don't write in <laughs> and then <laughs> still had the coupon so you do write in but he <laughs> as i say he was he was sort of a on those early although he struggled maybe to do it he still seems to have absolutely loved advertising and thought or at least thought that it had a a very important role to play it's one of the first kind of people i think he said yeah you know, advertising has a critical role to play in changing society and a lot of his work did help with that it seems like he even got fired sometimes for <laughs> for doing uh for doing some stuff that was maybe not the brand didn't originally want him to do but um, but the things you were saying earlier, Steve, about the process, I thought was really interesting. The $50,000 $50, dealing with a CEO. Because I was trying to think, how did how did he, you know, to me, he looks like he's a kind of naughty schoolboy in the sense that I was thinking about it earlier, that lots of really good work comes out of taking the piss out of the brief or the product or something. And you think, sometimes you think, hang on, this could actually be a campaign. 
And and of course, these things are like that. You know, there was a coupon that I looked at yesterday that said title, and it said, for example, president, you know, if you're the president of the USA, put it there. And it just feels like he's just messing about. You know, it doesn't feel like he's got his serious head on. It just feels like he's being a bit anarchic and messing around. But the process is how you would... The process that would allow him to do that, I thought was really interesting. What do you think his work style was? Is he had sort of... Ogilvy at the time was this sort of famed for maybe research-driven. Burnback was kind of more the pared-back creativity for creativity's sake. Not probably 100% there, but, you know, kind of... What was what was Howard's style? So he, he, he got on well with Ogilvy, or at least respected him, if I remember rightly. All for yeah. Him. But he had no, he, he didn't go along with Ogilvy's belief in research, you know, kind of. Uh, Howard, I don't think Howard did a lot of research. Um, Howard, uh, Howard uh, understood his audience. He didn't write too much for, for the mass market. It must be admitted. He wasn't, he, you couldn't get him writing an ad for Jello or, you know, kind of. Um, mm. So, uh, and he, his, his, his meter of choice was New Yorker, and he understood that he was dealing with people who could, you know, kind of see the see the joke behind the advertising and such. But Dave, Dave's point about the fifty thousand dollars—he was the first advertising man to actually sell ideas. Um, even I mean, Burnback and Ogilvy were still making the money out of nicking fifteen percent of the media off the off the of the client, you know, um, which which encouraged repetition of advertising. You know, the more money you could spend on media, the more money you made out of out of the client. Whereas Gossage said, if you, the best ad is the ad that only needs to run once that everybody sees, and so you're going to give me fifty thousand dollars, and I'll come up with that ad or the follow up ads to it. But uh, but I only also want to talk to the president or the CEO because you. The marketing people won't have the power or actually the courage to say yes to the things I'm going to present to, which was um, quite refreshing. It's very interesting, as you say, is he seems to have really understood the New Yorker audience um, in that when, when you look at his his ads, or most of the ads that you, you can read in this book, they are of a certain style, of a certain, you know, they're they're sort of almost expecting a certain intellect from from the other mm. side um but they i love the way that he tries to do these sort of series and kind of i think you mentioned it in the book as well it's it's almost like he he builds communities or social networks in a way before mm. social networks were even a thing it's just it, it there was lots of there seemed to have been a lot of future planning when he was even writing his first ad, it kind of almost you would imagine he must have had all these other ones in 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 place already or in the, in the back of his head. Is that true? Do you think? Or? Yeah. Well, I mean, he famously said, "We do one ad at a time." You know, he would never mm. go in there and present it like. So here's the above the line advertising. Here's the 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 channel advertising. Here's your advertising for Valentine's Day and Christmas. Here's he would do one ad, and then he famously said, we wait for the response to come in, and then we do another ad. He said, we might do three ads, but the time, but by the time the second ad has run, the third one will be obsolete. It won't, because the feedback will have taken us somewhere else. Um, and that, again, was a quite unique a- approach um, that he wanted to generate response. He, 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 he just lived for his audience, basically. As we say in the book, he was a showman. He, he, it was the Gossage show, you know, um, and he stressed his audience with ultimate respect. When we, you might know this, the answer to this one, um, Steve, is it, does Jeff Goodby and Dan Wyden again mention in the book that they sort of saw him as a kindred spirit? Um, and I think we, we were chatting on a conversation the other day. I was like, yeah, in my head, he kind of reminds me a bit of Dan Wyden. <laughs> Um, like, uh, why Why do you think uh, Jeff and, and Dan thought that? I mean, I, I think they said that they were doing what they were, what they're doing 50 years earlier. I don't know. I, um, I, 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 def, I, I'll pass over on this. I'm not, I'm, I'm much more familiar <laughs> with Wiener and Gossage's work than I am with uh, Wyden and Kennedy's. So I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. 
Um, I, I can't I can't imagine Howard uh, coming up with a with a, a campaign focused around just do it. Frankly, can you? I don't know. Uh, no, no. But I, I wonder whether it was because he still got you know. Again, reading reading through the book, there seems to be lots of campaigns that he that he did, like the paper, there's a famous paper aeroplane um, commercial where he did a, a sort of um, people could write in and, and send their own designs for paper aeroplanes, but they were getting tens of thousands of responses, and I guess like back then, you know, now that's maybe not so impressive because you can put a post up in it because maybe get eleven thousand comments, but back then you wouldn't have that many people normally writing in and a lot of his ads seem to have he did have you know lots of fun competitions and and fun things and they ended up taking on a life of their own and becoming big international things i mean i the one the ones that blew my mind was that he invented what was it the uh a bark t-shirts or or brass yeah that was it sorry in the early work there is a campaign that's probably gossage albeit it's on tv which is Fresh Mex, where they would do yeah. um, an ad every day when they were making the uh, guacamole and the, the Mexican food to show it's fresh, and then hold up the newspaper and talk about some stuff that was happening that day and the fact that their ads were fresh and that they were fresh every day, and they'd just do new ones, new content every day, um, which feels like the kind of thing he might. You know, he might do. Yeah, playing with the medium and and involving Updates involving the audience in in the act of creation. Yeah, yeah. It's like the New Yorker was his private Facebook. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think um, the, the 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 message of the book, I think one one of them is that he he was determined to make brands famous. Um, and, and clients famous, um, and not just the not and not just amongst people who are the target audience for you know kind of rainy a beer or Qantas airplanes or you know kind of eagle shirts or whatever you know kind of he always looked beyond that sh- small constituency to so that people who'd never use pay, quite fly internationally who'd never drink. Who were teetotalers would know about Irish whiskey, would know about Rainier Ale, would know about Paul Mass and Wines, because because his advertising attracted their attention and they got and it got them talking about it, you know, kind of. And Jeremy Bulmore's whole thing on fame when he when he wrote his Posh Spice and Purcell article was that to be famous you've got to be known beyond the people who are your target audience, and fame invests brands. With an incalculable value, you know, kind of, um, and and that's pretty much what advertising's job is to make brands famous. And Howard got there in pretty much every piece of work that he did, you know, which is a riposte to hyper targeting. <laughs> yeah, could you just share like one or two of your your favourite bits of his work, just so that people have an idea of what kind of things he would do? Okay, uh, new <laughs> coa margarine. This was when Howard had been fired from Brissasha Wiener and stuff, uh, and he got the job as the account handler for Nukoa Margarine. is a famous margarine in the States, one of the first founded in the 1920s. It wanted to keep its name before the people in classic brand building style or brand maintenance style, and hired Howard to do this task. And I, I imagine looking at post I'm post rationalizing it but I think that they they probably asked him to do some radio spots um for it uh, what he did was he and Stan Freeberg um they hired a guy who had un- up until then been a sign writer in the midwest um uh, called Dudley um and and a crop sprayer he was a sign writer and a crop sprayer in an aeroplane so he wrote signs but in his spare time did crop spraying out in the Midwest. And they hired him to write New Coa above the Manhattan skyline for five days running. And they printed an ad, mm-hmm. published an ad in the New Yorker, which, and the New York Times, which said, good luck to Dudley. You know, kind of, he's going to be doing this over the coming week. Uh, he's never done it before, but our prayers go with him. And of course, for the next five days, for the next four days, 
he misspelt Nukoa every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And the radio ads, shame, embarrassingly or mock embarrassingly, had to announce that he'd got it wrong again. He'd got it wrong again. So by Friday, the whole of Manhattan stops at midday to see, is he going to do it? He's got one more day to do it right, you know, um, which, of course, he did. But by then, the people in Nukoa had been suitably outraged by the way he'd fucked around with their brand name that they fired him. Um, and thereafter, he had no, no alternative but really to start his own agency, which is how his own agency kicked off. So I think that's a, right. that's a very good example of, of fame, making Nukoa famous beyond anybody who'd, who'd there, you know, and also f fun. He was just great fun. <laughs> you know, he entertained and people. Dave, and Dave, uh, any famous examples of me? I don't know. The thing that sprang to mind, I mean, there's lots of stuff in the in the book, but there's a lot of funny ads and ads that I really like. I mean, the thing that I really like that's sort of grown on me over time is the little pink uh, valve caps for cars. So with Fina, obviously, did pink air. And and come up with this little idea of giving away free pink valve caps for cars' tyres. And it's just such a clever idea because, A, it pings out, costs nothing, a little bit of plastic, you just screw on your car, it pings out, and it's almost like you're part of a little club if you've got a little one of those pink things on there. And it's just such a good use of money. It's like, um, it's just it, to me, it's a, such a clever little idea. And even in one of the Rover ads, it's, there's a rover ad that's done like a fashion ad, kind of making fun of the fact that sort of it looks terrible. It doesn't look classy. It's a rugged thing. And it's done like a fashion ad. And it's referenced in there, the pink, you know, it's, it's going through all the things that the rover's got. And he's managed to reference the FINA pink uh, uh, valve caps in that. But so things like that. So there's a lot of things. Uh, and I've said to a few people that if you skim through it, you'll see lots of text heavy uh, press ads, but when you actually read, you know, what they're about, what happened, and the offshoots of those, it's PR really. It's all PR and things like that mm -hmm. little, you know, half a cent little bit of plastic that you can just send out, and he's so clever to me. It's, I love that. I have a feeling that in today's world, he would actually be really successful. Yeah. In that he seems to have a way of of writing that really creates interesting stories within themselves like i would imagine that a lot of the time his ads were more were as or more in, interesting than the the articles that were surrounding them themselves yeah um i mean i, I in the book you mentioned it that, that people wrote in to complain that you know following ads weren't weren't in the magazine the next week with some of them i think it was a whiskey brand uh, that he was he was working on, if I remember no, right. It was the first ad that he ever wrote. It was uh, Bank of America, and he was writing a sequence of ads. And it was, I, we, Dave and I, reckon they're the first f well, whimsical, amusing financial services Hans ever attempted. And he, he was going to go through the alphabet, A, B, C, D, whatever. And they were, A is for whatever, and they had a lovely cartoon alongside them. And... Uh, stockholders wrote in saying this is all a bit too um uh, irreverent for a bank ad can you and so they 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 pulled the advertising uh only for people who were really enjoying the ads to write in and say well what happened after m because they got as far as m you know kind of what what happens next what happened to uh, tragic lm and what happened to O? you know kind of and so they they re resumed the advertising so but he always invited a response. That was his thing. He said a response gives an energy, not only to the advertising, but to the company who produces it, to the brand. It brings the, you know, you've got to, you've got to involve the audience. He said audience involvement was everything. Um, uh, that was the whole point of advertising. His first loyalty was to the audience and not to his clients, you know. One of the other things I thought was interesting related to that bank ad was he seemed to be have a remarkable talent for spotting interesting people before they were famous and almost helping them become famous. Um, and that, that I think that 
two that kind of stood out for me. There was one of them, the main one that I was astounded at was Marshall McLuhan. I think he sort of was an early day uh, kind of PR genius. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I wondered if, if either of you would want to talk a little bit about that. For me, one of the most fascinating parts of the book is the final chapter where we take on the things that he did, where, where we see what he did for McLuhan and what he did for other people and helping them to become famous through the prism of his own, his own talent for self-publicization. He was, he, as Dave has recently just found more and more PR of Gossage PR and the guy could turn the most mundane thing into of his own personal life, not just for advertising. Most mundane things became, uh, you know, kind of newspaper co- uh, coverage. You know, he was a he was a, a shameless self publicist. You know, but the thing about Howard was that it was the core of it was a massive talent. Whereas, and the the, the last chapter is about personal branding. And, um, and now that is a pretty heinous concept or has become one because everyone's obsessed with promoting their personal brand, but not too concerned about having a talent or a skill to, apart from for self promotion to go behind it. But yeah, Howard was very good at promoting others, but brilliant at promoting himself. I think Freeberg was pretty well known, um, uh, on the, on the kind of um, what you'd call the comedy circuit now, you know, kind of on the stand-up circuit. But I don't think by the, in the mid fifties he was. I don't. I, I, I guess he certainly didn't discover him. Um, but they didn't do each other any harm by collaborating as often as they did. Um, and you and I think the stuff you found, Dave, is when Gossage becomes at his most eccentric. It is when he is working with Freeberg, you know, yeah. when they do push the limits of what advertising can do. And uh, it really is quite, quite outlandish stuff, some of it. Do I think Freeberg did his first ads with Gossage? And that was 56. So it opened up a whole advertising career for Freeberg, who did a lot of really good stuff. Well, on I, his own, I, well as we... you know, the, I mean, Gossage's biggest. Big breakthrough when he said, "Hell, I, you know." Someone said, "Don't, don't be careful. You'll be famous." He said, "Hell, I want. I've never been famous before. I'm going to enjoy this." He, with the Qantas uh, kangaroo ad, uh, would be the first on your block to win a kangaroo, and that made him famous. And then you, Dave, found stuff I'd never seen before: the Qantas Sylvania ads, which. I still can't get my head around. Have a look at them, Chris. They're, they're the ones that about be, become an archduke. Um, and you see at the end of that, the, the, fir- the prize giving, the judges are amongst, well, one of the one is Anna Mae Wong for some reason, but the other judge is Stan Free. One of the other judges is Stan Freeberg, which does again in the small print, you see free, other judge Stan Freeberg, which does indicate that Stan, had, had a hand in this bit of real craziness, um, which yeah. I, even I, you know, I think you deserve a kangaroo if you can work it out yourself, to be quite honest. Some of the stunts that he did as well, it, I mean, they, yeah, they are brilliant. But was the one I, I remember he said, uh, was it Rainer, Rainer Strong Beer? Rainer, he made yeah. a whole thing about not for women. It was kind of almost like Yorkie chocolate bar advertising, but mm-hmm. 60 years earlier or something. It's absolutely yeah. the same camp, really. Yeah. I wonder how many sort of more modern day ad campaigns have been inspired by by his work. Um, there certainly seems to be some crossover and stuff. Ooh. Well, both um, um, both Guppies and uh, they called Boguski's place. It was Crispin Porter, would Alex, yes, but incredibly. Porter. No. They would say, "What would Gossage do?" Yeah, as a smart yeah. point, and I think obviously, particularly with digital, he sort of made for social media. I would have definitely. I think one of, one of my favourites was um, he, uh, he. I think it was for Land Rover, sort of taking the piss out of David Ogilvy's famous yeah. ad. Yeah, yeah, sixty miles an hour. The the only 
sound you'll hear here in the Rolls Royce is the sound of the clock or something. And then he was like, at 60 miles an hour, the only thing you'll hear in the Land Rover is the engine noise. It's <laughs> the roar of the engine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely brilliant. It, it definitely had a, 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 compared to a lot of ads that I read from around this time, it was a very casual style of writing. He, he writes as though he's talking, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, yeah, totally. Is that something that, that you know, you, you think we should see more of? It feels like it's got a little bit formal, isn't it? I think, I think uh, certainly, you know, Birnbeck obviously gets a lot of credit for it, but uh, there used to be a mm. lot more, um, a bit, I, I think there used to be, talking more like the man on the street or the woman on the street, it feels a little bit formal and sometimes pretentious and stiff. It doesn't seem as chatty as it used to. Well, I think it's because there are lots of typists and not enough copywriters. That, that's one of the reasons that body copy is seen as something that goes, that you need like 60 words of, if you, if that, and that goes underneath, uh, under sufferance of the art director, that goes underneath, if you've got a headline, you might be lucky about that as well. So I think an appeal for more conversational copy, uh, I would say that the, an appeal for some copy at all would be, it would be valid. And the only conversational copy you get now is, and Paul Burke is spinning in his grave as a result of it, because Paul, God bless him, was the man who introduced the innocent style of conversational copy, which for a couple of years was very good, um, but has then been copied. So the only time you get conversational copy is on the back of your cornflakes packet or on the back of your tomato sauce jar bar, or, the, or the back of your, 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 your marmalade jar where you've got the jar. Hi, how are you doing? I'm a marmalade jar. You know, yeah. kind of, you know kind of, and, it, and it's just like, stupid hipster crap, you know, kind of um, self-indulgent hipster crap, you know, kind of, and that's supposed to be talking conversationally to you. Um, so, no, I don't think anyone's approximating Howard's um, conversational style. And, and as Dave says, and otherwise, it's pretty formal and it's pretty flat and it's pretty workmanlike otherwise. Um, Dave, Dave mentioned... Uh, Crispin Porter, and um, and it really just jogged my memory when you said, do any advertisers emulate what Gossage is doing? And, of course, the main thing that Gossage has been copied, the main aspect of Cop Gossage's approach has been the idea that the ad is simply the starting point for a media strategy that involves all other unpaid-for media. You know, okay. kind of Gossage I regarded the ad as something that if I now get the newspapers to... Uh, report on it, get the radio to report on it, write a book about it, get a book sold, you know, make toys out of it, you know, kind of. And I would imagine that every Grand Prix winner outside of film over the past 15 years has borrowed from what yeah. Gossage called his ad platform technique, that, that how much PR can we get out of this? How many, you know, and I think, uh, and, you know, and again, Gossage was there in the 60s. 30, 40 years before Crispin Porter were the first to do it. Droga 5 uh, built a career on it, I think, of uh, stunts, basically, to get reported upon. I tried to do it because I got into Gossage before anyone else, before you know, in the 90s and everything. So we had quite a bit of success doing, you know, publicity generating pieces of work, you know. But, uh, but now everybody does it. I think Crispin Fulton got a lot of coverage when I think Alex Boguski said the first thing they have on the brief is what does the PR release, what does the press release look like? Is that, and at the time, it was a very, it, it's a very unusual thing to say. And I remember that was like 20 odd years ago. Um, and it's a good way wow. of doing it. And I think by the looks of it, Gossage just, that was, he didn't need to come up with that as a philosophy because that's just what he did. But but that thing of well, what is a mm. press release? Why would someone in a newspaper write about this? Uh, is a good start point, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
But I think there's some, some there's a parallel there between Gossage and Alex Boguski in that both of them were also shameless self publicists. That that actually the ads were ads for themselves. You know, I have um, and Howard said this in the in the last chapter of the book. He says that the ads he is part of the advertising. The ads are for him. You know, and the copywriter has got to put their head above the the parapet parapet and do something dangerous. You know. Um, is that, you know, is, you're, 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 you're performing without a net, he said, you know, to do it. If you're doing it right, you're working without a net. And I don't mean a net, you know, kind of female cop art director. You're working without a net, you know. But he's also put his head in a couple of the ads, isn't he? So he's in one of the KLA Oh, ads, God, yeah. A rover ad. Yeah. Rover ad, which is unusual psychologically. If I've written an ad to think, Maybe it should be a picture of me. It's such a weird concept. You know? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you you discovered something um, again, Dave. Dave is. I, I, I've said this before that Dave uh, Alice Lowe said to me that Howard would, was such a perfectionist that he would write, would keep writing the ads after they'd appeared in the New Yorker, you know, and she'd have to tell him it's here, Howard. It's here. Look, it's in. It's in this. You can stop now. And Dave is still. Dave, yesterday, Dave sent me a a gossage stunt, and he got the Land Rover in the parked it in the middle of San Francisco on Market Street, stopped the traffic, uh, had his beautiful wife uh, Sally, the actress Sally, standing next to it, and he announced that there will be a this, this car. This truck can withstand the, 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 the weight of a charging rhino and there will be a rhino here in five minutes. And so it generates the plea, you know, the, the press photographers, the people from the Chronicle. And it's, you can't trust rhinos anymore, you know, and just, of course, there was no charging rhino, but it was, he got his wife there to add a bit of glamour to the thing and, you know, just shameless self publicity for himself. Publicity for the car, you know, kind of. Uh, but he wanted that spotlight. Steve, are you sure she wasn't talking about you being a perfectionist copywriter? No, I'm, I'm pretty slapdash in comparison to Dave. <laughs> I don't think so. But what um, I, I I know uh, we're sort of getting towards the end. But what what it, you've both immersed yourself in this man's work for a long time. I mean, and Steve for for years now. But what a sort of <laughs> Two, one or two of the of the top lessons that you each take away from his work. If you sort of, if you were meeting a friend for a dinner party who, who didn't know him, what would be your two sort of biggest takeaways, uh, life lessons? Uh, spring to mind for me would be have fun with it, don't take it so seriously, and then as we've been discussing, think beyond the page or the screen or whatever it is. Think what what yeah. is this going to do outside of the medium. Uh, but then in doing that, have, just enjoy it, have fun with it. I mean, he looks, you know, it's funny because a lot of the pictures, the photos, he looks a bit serious and miserable, uh, particularly the older ones. But actually, he just looks like he's had fun creating all of them. It just feels like it's messing around. He looks like he's really enjoyed it to me when you read them and see them. Um, so kind of, yeah, just to remind you. yourself to enjoy it. I mean, I think humour could do with we could do with more humor in advertising it sort of diminished a bit I, I, I agree entirely um for this for the what shines through you know kind of in this work for his commercial clients is that he was almost incapable of doing a conventional ad and he was in, even more incapable of doing a straight and serious pole-faced one and i think our industry over the past 10 years with its with its obsession with its uh, with social purpose and with its obsession with supposedly changing culture, has taken itself so seriously, and it has forgotten that uh, people do not, you know, they'd rather have their rig ribs tickled than someone pointing a finger in their chest, telling them, you know, kind of how they should be behave and what they should buy, you know, kind of they want to be entertained. And not educated, and I think that Howard is a a, a fabulous antidote to self-important, pole-faced advertising. 
That's fascinating. I, I mean, my my mine after reading your book was probably that if you want to think differently, surround yourself with different people. He seems to have surrounded himself by not very many people from the ad world at all mm. and almost purposely shunned everyone in, in advertising in order to surround himself by lots of people from entertainment, from the yeah. academic sphere. Yeah. And he seems to have pulled off those people and and put that into the advertising. Mm, absolutely true. Yeah, we, we we talked about it a bit before before we got hopped on the call that he had all of these amazing sort of parties at his agency. It seems to have been a you know real social get together. And I think in the book you say that his his wake was was held there, and it was almost the you know, it wasn't really a somber affair. It was a it sounded like a party. Like Which, a good, good remember, as you say, Chris, that must um, bleed into his advertising. If you you know if your goal is to create something the most interesting bit of the New Yorker. And it's not that your advertising mm. makes you going to see it. It's John Steinbeck and uh, Truman Capote or whatever it may be. It probably does um, push you a bit further than if yeah. it's uh, an art director think, in the agency over the road. I mean, ideas famously come from a well-furnished mind, you know, and if all you've got, if your furniture is all designed by an advertising person, you know, kind of because you're so steeped in the advertising industry, your, your, your ideas are going to be advertising ideas, you know, kind of. But if you're, if the ideas that you've got a book, Mr. Fuller's and Marshall McLuhan's and John Steinbeck's and John Houston, you know, kind, kind of, and, and, and Jessica Mitford and Dr. Spock, then you, what are you, you're bringing something fresh and new, aren't you, to, to put on the page? You know, as I said, he was a he was an intellectual who happened to be an advertising man, and not only I know quite a few advertising men who happen to be intellectuals, but Howard was certainly the opposite. He well, not the opposite, the adverse. He was an intellectual who just happened to be in advertising. That's uh, that's incredible. Um, yeah, and uh, and obviously you can buy the book now from any good bookstore. Um, and I'm any bad not bad sure about bookstore. That. Um, uh, I think it's Amazon um, online and Am Amazon is your good friend. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a brilliant book, and uh, as you say, it's just it's amazing. I mean, particularly Dave, thank you so much for going through all those New Yorker things. I mean, having the opportunity to look at ads that probably no one has seen for mm. fifty or sixty years is pretty remarkable. And yeah. um, there's a, and I think we can learn a lot from looking at the past. Um, mm. So, I think you've done the industry a huge, both done the industry a huge uh, service by by making this book. And really, really thank you. And thank um, you. I hope uh, I hope lots and lots of people get get to get to read it. Um, it'd be be lovely if sort of agency bosses or people in advertising just bought this book for everyone in the agency or something. It's mm. it's, it's really really brilliant and and fun, as you say. Mm. Like he was a showman. It is very humorous, so uh, yeah, it's a very enjoyable read as well. But um, yeah, thank you so so much, and uh, I mean, my hope, pleasure. Hope thank to you. Chat Chris. again soon, and uh, and perhaps have a drink one day in person. So, please, uh, please, I would well. love that. Lots and lots of love to you both, and thank you so yeah, much again. Thanks again. Thanks, thank Chris. you. Cheers. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Forty Two Courses podcast. If you did, please like and share. Uh, any comments are also very very welcome. And of course, if you want to learn more about us, visit our website at 42courses.com. Thanks again.